The palace was worried that a future queen could have been around the block a bit before sitting on the throne. What the fuck is going on? Who gives a shit? Today's video is brought to you by Squarespace, the only one platform for building your brand and growing your business online. I'm going to tell you more about them later. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. As always, I'm your host, Simon. Welcome, welcome. This one, written by Danny, read by me, never read it before. Mind-boggling bloodlines and astonishing abdications. More royal family scandals. Tell you what, Danny, <laughs> that title's going to be adjusted before this goes on YouTube because that is a mouthful, son. Let's go. Although I don't consider myself to be that old and creaky, I've witnessed 10 different UK prime ministers and 14 different chancellors of the Exchequer in my lifetime. I feel like most of those have come in the last like couple of years, though, right? What was that Liz Truss lettuce thing? It's like she survived like less than a month or something. Jesus. Bearing in mind the current chaotic state of UK politics, it feels as if many of those came and went within the last six months. Danny and I, same page as always. But in contrast, up until the very recent death of Queen Elizabeth II. What? What? The Queen died? When? No, I'm just kidding. I know the Queen died. Ha! <laughs> Got him. God rest her soul. Long live the king. <laughs> Who gives a shit? I'd only ever win as one British monarch on the throne, and it's still taking a bit of an adjustment to remember that God should now be saving the king rather than the queen. In fact, anyone under the age of 70 would have only witnessed one British monarch on the throne, as Queen Elizabeth II made herself pretty comfy after first taking the seat in 1952. Admittedly, her longevity is largely down to the fact that she never faced the risk of getting booted out every four years by disgruntled voters. Her right to rule was instead largely determined by dissent, even though the royal bloodline got a little muddy over the years, a point which we'll return to later. This is one of those things, it's like, it is insane that King Charles is just there because of descent and blood, which is f***ing mental, isn't it? Like, what the f*** are we up to in Britain and all the other countries that have royal families or just people who are in charge by other means than... I, I, th I honestly think, like, dictators have more of a, a right to rule than royal families because, at least, I mean, they made some effort to get there. That is f*** up. Yeah, tell me about it. So, do you want to build your brand and grow your business online? Of course you do. You'd be an idiot not to. So, what you need, because you're not an idiot, of course, is Squarespace. With Squarespace, you can stand out with a beautiful website. You can engage with your audience. You can even sell things if you want. Look. Maybe you're an artist, you got some art to sell. Maybe you're an educator, you got some education to sell. Maybe you're a blogger, you got some blogs to sell. I don't know, look, whatever you're selling, you can sell it with Squarespace and it's easy. It's super easy to navigate, it's got drag and drop features. You put together a beautiful looking website very, very easily. And then there's more advanced features. Look, there's something called member areas. Look, if you're a creator, if you're an educator, you can monetize your content by selling access to gated content like classes, online courses, or newsletters. It's a great way to unlock a new revenue stream for your business and free up time in your schedule. Nice. Also, they've got email campaigns. I talked about previously how I used to pay a lot of money every month for like email campaign stuff through an unnamed company. It's very expensive. And then I found out it was included in Squarespace. It's like, wow. Squarespace, you legends. How do you do it? And then once you've got your website up and running, if you want to learn about people who are visiting your website, well, you've got analytics, which gives you all this information about people who visit your website. You can see what they're interacting with, how long they're staying there, where they're from, etc., which is all super useful. So, look, don't wait any longer. Head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash blaze to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain using the code blaze. Yes, there's a link below. And now back to today's video. Arguably more effort than with democracy. Being a dictator is hard to get to power. But you only have to go back a couple of monarchs to a time when a king couldn't even last a full year on the throne. And what was considered to be one of the biggest upsets in over a thousand years of history for the English and later the British monarchy, King Edward the Eighth. It's a Roman numeral, so I'm always like five, six, seven, eight. There we go. Took the incredibly rare step of abdicating from the throne after choosing to marry an American divorcee who was accused of being a Nazi spy. There's a movie about this. Is it a movie with Madonna? <laughs> I don't think so, though. Right? There's something. What's the Madonna connection? There is, isn't there? Something like that. There's a movie. Or is it directed by Guy Ritchie or some shit like that? I don't know. We'll have to dig a bit deeper to discover whether the issue was that his fiance was a divorcee. Divorcee? Divorcee? A Nazi spy or an American. The abdication of King Edward VIII. His real name was Dave. <laughs> 
<laughs> it was David. But he took the name of King Edward VIII when he ascended to the throne in January 1936. Edward had already met American socialite Wallace Simpson a few years earlier, and rumors had begun circulating around the palace that the prince was secretly dating Wallace, but Edward was always quick to deny them. His father, George V, hadn't seemed too impressed with the idea as he refused to meet Wallace and banned her from attending any upcoming Silver Jubilee events. Well, I guess you just have to be prepared to die. But after George popped his clogs and Edward took the throne, the new king felt that it was time to stop keeping secrets as he planned a radio broadcast to announce his intention to marry Wallace Simpson. After all, who would dare to stand in the way of the king? Well, quite a few people, it turns out. The problem wasn't so much that Wallace was an American socialite, although that itself would have been controversial as royals traditionally married other royals back then. It was more to do with the fact that Wallace had already been divorced once and was dating the king whilst working through a second divorce that hadn't yet even been finalized yet. Oh my lord, the scandal! Oh. It's a bit ridiculous, isn't it? Also, <laughs> back when the time... Sorry, spitting my bits of my lunch. Yeah! Back in the time when it was like, yeah, you can only date other royals. It's like, oh, well, that sounds like a really small and incestuous dating pool. The Church of England technically did not allow a royal to marry a divorcee, so the thought of the king marrying a twice divorcee was bringing the church out in boils. The British government also felt that such a marriage would be deeply morally unacceptable by the public, and the nation would never tolerate the idea of Queen Wallace. In the face of a constitutional crisis, Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin secretly met with Edward at Buckingham Palace before the new king had a chance to get anywhere near a radio microphone and blabber on about his devotion to Wallace. Stanley initially suggested that Edward should marry a nice, unspoiled, non-divorce and just keep Wallace on the side as his mistress. <laughs> well, if the Prime Minister says so! <laughs> it's a weird advice to be getting that from a Prime Minister, isn't it? But Edward wasn't having any of that nonsense. His counter-suggestion was a morganatic marriage to Wallace. What the f is a morganatic marriage, which would essentially mean that she wouldn't be awarded any royal titles and their children would not inherit the throne? Isn't that going to be a bit of a problem for succession? I don't know. But Stanley wasn't having any of that, and he also rebuffed Edward's idea of explaining his plight to the public on a, on a radio broadcast in hope of swaying opinion. I mean, I don't want to... I'm not entirely sure. But also, can the Prime Minister stop him? <laughs> He'd just be like, I'm king, it mattered back then. I mean, nowadays, the interesting thing about the way British politics works is if the Prime Minister wanted to get rid of the King, he totally could. He could just go to Parliament and be like, yo, yo, Parliament, should we get rid of the King? And if he's got like a strong enough majority in Parliament, he can absolutely do that. Because uh, the power of British Parliament is unlimited. There's a word for it. Um... I don't remember right now, but it basically means that Parliament can create whatever law they want as long as they will vote and make the law. Like the famous example given in the law textbooks is they could make smoking illegal on the streets of Washington, D.C., which, of course, people in Washington, D.C., the Americans are going to be like, what are you doing in British Parliament? Are you trying to sour diplomatic relations on purpose, you pricks? And we obviously don't care. We obviously don't care. There were wars, Britain. What the but theoretically, they can do whatever they want. That's a bit of a shame. We could maybe have decided the matter with a fun telephone vote or something. Ultimately, Stanley explained to the king that he had three options, end the relationship with Wallace, abdicate from the throne, or marry Wallace, which would prompt the government cabinet to resign in protest and throw the nation into political turmoil. Oh my god, who gives a shit? Who gives a shit what the royals want to do with their lives? I can't believe this is such an important thing. It's really bizarre to me. I'm just like, I don't know, I'm pretty Republican. I'm like, let's just be done with it. <laughs> Jesus. You can't do it! I can't. You are stressing me to hell. Edward did finally manage to get behind the radio mic at the end of the year, but it was to announce his surprise application. In the famous radio address, he revealed, I found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king. <laughs> I'm just assuming he's mega posh. I'm just assuming that because he's the king. I don't actually know how he sounded. They have radio of him right back in the day, right? My duties as king, and I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman that I love. <laughs> I feel like to do that, you gotta like really like droop the mouth like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> have you guys seen that video where it's like, um, it's, uh, I think it's done by an Australian because the voice isn't perfect and you can sometimes hear him becoming a bit Australian, but it's like King Charles giving a speech in some like big church or some shit after he just got coronated, but it's dubbed over and he's like talking about how he's gonna, he's gonna shake shit up. He's like, Lizzo, I'm gonna shake shit up. 
Charlie's in charge now. It's really good. It's very funny. I've watched it many times. Fascinating tangent, Simon. Let's carry on. The couple married in 1937, but nobody on the groom's side of the family bothered to show up. It was sometime later when it was first speculated that Wallace Simpson may have been a Nazi spy who was only attempting to get a foot in the palace door that so showed that she could pass on classified information to her Nazi superiors. This was largely fueled by a close relationship with German officials, including the German ambassador to the UK, her alleged admiration for Hitler, and the fact that one of her ex-spouses had connection with pro-Nazi groups in the UK. So she sounds like a lovely person. But the allegations seem largely unfounded, and there was never any proof that she was working for the Nazis. Of more concern was the speculation that Edward himself may have been a Nazi spy. Oh no, this seems unlikely. But he certainly displayed sympathies to Hitler's cause, and believed that the war should be avoided if everyone just agreed to Germany's territorial demands. <laughs> He's like, yeah, yeah, no, I have sympathy for Hitler. Who doesn't hate the Jews? Especially Hitler. Following his abdication, he even met up with Hitler. I, I, look, he's long dead, but I don't think he probably actually said that, did he? He even met up with Hitler in Germany in 1937, exchanging Nazi salutes with the Fuhrer. That's not a good look, bro. Before engaging in a private 50-minute chat. Later in 1940, there were rumors that after Hitler had conquered Britain, he planned to reinstate his mate Eddie as king, albeit a sort of fascist puppet king. But this may have just been Nazi propaganda designed to infuriate the enemy. What actually happened after the Second World War is Edward and Wallace moved to France and retired from public view, living happily ever after until Edward's death in 1972. Well, that's a really nice ending for them, I have to say. That sounds a lot better than having to be the king with some sort of non-queen wife and then your children are, like, not really royals and shit. That probably matters to you a lot, so yeah, fuck it, just move to France. It's nice there, it's good weather, they got great wine, nice food, fine. Great baguettes they put under their arms and they get all sweaty. Mmm, so good and tasty. They probably just call you King Roast Beef. Some might consider this to be quite a touching love story. <laughs> but perhaps Edward was right to choose true love over the throne, but all of this had a profound effect on Edward's niece, a very young Princess Elizabeth who wasn't very impressed with her uncle's abdication and came to the conclusion that abdication was a dereliction of duty. And that might partly explain why she was so determined to stay glued to the throne for about a thousand years. Annas Horribilis. Of course, Queen Elizabeth's long reign wasn't all cocktail parties and hat shopping. In 1992, she took time to inform her subjects that she'd had a properly shitty year. She didn't quote 1992. Okay, let's see what happened in 1992. I don't know anything about 1992. I was five. She didn't quite phrase it like that, preferring instead to describe 1992 as Annas Horribilis, a Latin term for horrible year. And there was certainly more than enough to look back upon with anguish. For starters, one of her principal royal residents took a hit when a fire sparked by a faulty spotlight blazed through Windsor Castle and took over 15 hours to extinguish. Oh no, she's gonna have to live in one of her other castles. The poor dear. Nobody was seriously hurt and no historic treasures were damaged. If you did, most people don't have historic treasures to damage, Liz. Chill the fuck out. But 115 rooms were destroyed. You've got 115 rooms, Liz! Were destroyed and the repair bill amounted to some 36 million pounds. Good news, you can afford it. Public sympathy turned to public outrage when Prime Minister John Major cheerfully suggested that the taxpayer should foot the bill. You could f right off, John. She's rich. How about, how about she pays for it a f***ing self? Like if my house burns down, I have to pay for it. I mean, my insurance company. Why is her insurance company not paying for it? What the fuck? <laughs> A suggestion which didn't, didn't go down well as the queen doesn't even pay tax. Yes, what the fuck? An insurance company pays for it. You didn't even pay the insurance company. The fire ultimately led to the queen paying tax. Oh, God damn it, teleprompter. The fire ultimately led to the Queen paying tax for the first time, while the doors of Buckingham Palace were opened up to the public for eight pounds a pop to help cover the majority of the repair costs. Oh, Buckingham Palace, because it was Windsor Castle, so that was like, wait, it's burned down. Who wants to see that? But it was different, because she's got many palaces, even if it was just the parts of the palace that the Queen had probably forgotten about. But it was the personal relationships of her children that were the forefront of Addis Horribilis. Well, you had many of those later, Prince Andrew. <laughs> All three of her married children either separated or divorced within the same year. Princess Anne made... I don't even know who the... Princess Anne is. Is this one of her kids? I couldn't even tell you how many kids she has. I know there's Charles, I know there's Andrew, and there's some other less famous ones, like Princess Anne, apparently. She made history when she became the first child of a monarch. Boom, she's a child of the monarch. After nearly 20 years of marriage to first husband, Mark Phillips. Why do I know Mark Phillips? 
Why do I know his name? A divorce was announced in April, following rumors that both parties had become attached to other people. Not wanting to hang about, though, Anne had remarried by the end of the year, although the church ceremony had to be held in Scotland to circumvent the ridiculous Church of England rules about divorcees not being allowed to remarry. The 1986 marriage of Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson. Who the fuck are these people? Oh, Prince Andrew, I know. Sarah Ferguson? Never even heard of her. Lasted just six years before they announced their separation. Although Andrew and Sarah are thought to be on good terms today. <laughs> I don't imagine Andrew's got many friends from like the past. <laughs> or maybe he does. I don't know. Maybe he's just really, you know, people are standing by old Prince Andrew. <laughs> a weirdo. <laughs> my opinion. They must have a lot of to thrash out over the years. For example, there was that time in 2010 when a clearly sloshed Sarah was secretly filmed by the News of the World newspaper accepting half a million pounds from an undercover reporter posing as an Indian businessman in return for access to Prince Andrew. <laughs> ah. Well, one, the News of the World could f*** right off because f*** the News of the World, right? But also, like, what's the other one? Wasn't there something recently? Whereas, like, that the time Prince Charles like accepted a large amount of money in cash from like the Saudis or something like that. I'm half remembering a story from like a year ago. And he was like, well, it's all above board. They're just donated to my charities. Look, look, and if anyone gives you just a big suitcase of cash, you have to wonder where that big suitcase of cash came from. Because if it was legitimate, this is a government. They don't generally operate, unless it's like, I don't know, the CIA flying money to Iraq or whatever. They don't generally operate on a cash basis, do they? You're right. It's fact. Sarah later claimed that she had been in the gutter at the time and was actually trying to raise the money for a friend. It was also, re if you're married to the son of the queen and you're like chasing after half a million pounds, what are you up to? What are you up to? It's also reported that she planned to sue the newspaper group for 45 million pounds on the grounds that the sting operation resulted in a loss of earnings and financial distress, although unsurprisingly that doesn't appear to have got anywhere. Um, to be honest, I'm not that surprised that that, I am kind of surprised that, that didn't get anywhere because the news of the world's I mean, they deserve all of that shit, in my opinion. But by far the biggest personal scandal relates to the current king and his consort Camilla, who had spent much of the 80s and early 90s in a controversial love triangle. Prince Charles and Camilla Shand had just found out that that's Camilla's surname. Who knew? When they'd originally fallen in love, they were both in their early 20s, but Charles had apparently been advised not to marry Camilla as she was not an aristocrat and had ever so shockingly dated other boyfriends before Charles. What? That f Harlot! <laughs> what an insane world we live in. The palace was worried that the future queen could have been around the block a bit before sitting on the throne. What the fuck is going on? Who gives a sh? So the pair split up. Parker Miller married Andrew Parker Bowles and Charles formed a relationship with 19-year-old Lady Diana Spencer, who was deemed far more acceptable by the palace as she had proper pedigree and was seen as more of a lily-white virgin who didn't even know what a willy looked like. That's... <laughs> I don't like thinking about this. <laughs> the problem was that even after Charles and Diana married in 1981, it was clear that he still had feelings for his former flame and that the feeling was mutual. Diana would later famously claim, there were three people in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. And it's not as if Charles was being particularly secretive about his affair with Camilla. Diana claimed that when she raised the matter with her husband, Charles replied that he refused to be the only Prince of Wales in history not to take a mistress. Classy act, that Charlie, isn't he? The public would later get an explicit taste of a love triangle in motion when a bugs 1980 oh i've heard this it's so f cringe oh dear cringe <laughs> Uh, a 1989 telephone call between charles and camilla was leaked to the press in which charles expressed his desire to wait for it live inside camilla's trousers but then laments that it would be just his luck to be reincarnated as a tampon want to just want to fucking chunder everywhere to be honest diana also embarked upon a string of her own affairs during this period including a famous five-year affair with army captain james hewitt who is definitely not prince harry's real class <laughs> And an earlier affair with her bodyguard, Barry Manneke, who was killed in a motorcycle accident in 1987. Diana later described his death as the biggest blow of her life, and a private tape conversation later revealed her suspicions. I think he was bumped off, but there we are. Holy sh**. Really? Ah, this is news to me. God damn. Diana and Charles had announced their separation by the end of Annas Horribilis, but it was another four years before Charles filed for divorce, a move prompted by Diana's highly controversial BBC interview in 1995 with Martin Bashir in 1995. Wait, did I read that twice? What's going on? I'm just an idiot. In which she spoke candidly of love triangles, the affairs, and her depression. Her mother-in-law 
That's the Queen, by the way. Wasn't particularly pleased with the broadcast. After consulting Prince Andrew, though I'm not sure why he was sticking his nose in this. The Queen, wasn't, isn't Prince Andrew like, didn't, the, isn't there this thing that she's his favorite kid or something? I, I've heard that as a rumor or something. I don't know if, they, she, if he still is, though. The Queen, well, no, of course she, of course he's not because she's dead. But I meant because of the, the Prince Andrew stuff with the, uh, you know what I'm talking about. The Queen urged Charles and Diana to get on with the divorce, which was finalized in 1996. Apparently, the Queen Mother refused to have Camilla's name spoken in their presence, and it took a while for Queen Elizabeth to warm to her. UK royal expert Tom Bauer claims that Elizabeth once told Charles that she wanted nothing to do with that wicked woman. Charles and Camilla eventually tied the knot in 2005, although the Queen didn't attend the civil ceremony. It was thought for years that after Charles took the throne, Camilla would be Princess Consort, but Elizabeth II upgraded this to Queen Consort shortly before her death. However, Charles has already taken this much further than his mother wanted. By referring to his wife as Queen Camilla in the invitations for the upcoming coronation, which I think is next weekend. As I'm recording this, probably already happens by the time I've recorded this. Long live the king. It seems that Charles's first true love was always destined to be his queen, but the couple were forced to take a pretty long-winded route to the throne. Dodgy DNA. When the remains of Richard III were found in a car park in Leicester, he had quite a lot to say for himself, considering that he had been dead for 500 years. When his remains were genetically tested, it was discovered that whilst his DNA matched up with the maternal branch of his living relatives, it did not match up with the paternal side of his descendants. To be more specific, it was found that there was no paternal match between Richard and his male line descendants, the fifth Duke of Beaufort, who died in 1803 and whose living relatives provided the DNA samples. What this means is that at some point leading up to the birth of the fifth Duke of Beaufort in 1744, there was a false paternity event which broke the royal chain. A royal mother gave birth to a royal child whose official royal father was not really his real father at all. It's impossible to ascertain where exactly in the chain this happened without digging up hundreds of years of royal bodies. Let's do it. Let's find it out. Let's go into their little dead cores and like extract some DNA like Jurassic Park. Let's clone all those fucks. Those are his clones. But has led some to speculate whether Charles III is even the rightful king after all. For example, it could potentially mean that Henry VII had no genuine lineage to the royal family and that the House of Tudor should never have taken the throne in 1485, but I wouldn't worry about it too much as the whole concept of inheriting the throne is largely a load of old bollocks anyway. Whilst it's widely accepted that the current royal family are descended in some way from Alfred the Great, the first king of England, or at least king of Wessex from 871, it's not like the crown has been passed down an unbroken line of direct descendants from Alfred. History has thrown a few curveballs along the last thousand years, and the raw bloodline has become a little bit complicated and messy. Going back to the example of Henry VII, his blood claim to the throne was always weak at best, with or without a false paternity event, and he technically claimed the throne by right of conquest. So if ascension to the throne is a vaguely random lottery that goes against every democratic principle, it does make you wonder why we put up with all of this meaningless nonsense in the 21st century. It does, doesn't it, Danny? It does. As Eve Livingston from The Independent argued, the royal family exists as a glaring symbol of the unearned privilege and equality that pervades the roots of British society. And, uh, she's fucking bang on, isn't she? But do the British public get anything tangible from this archaic arrangement? Some might argue that the royal family are the biggest benefits grounders in history. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you could, couldn't you? But they most likely turn a sizable profit for the economy. In a sense, their celebrity influences do drum up publicity, trade, foreign investment, and of course, tourism. They're technically funded by the taxpayer through the sovereign grants, which came to £86 million in 2022. Aren't they super rich from all the land and shit they own? S uh, anyway? <laughs> The taxpayer also funds an undisclosed but doubtless pretty hefty sum for round-the-clock personal security for senior royals. Yet whilst it's impossible to accurately assess how much the royal family brand generates for the economy, some financial experts have estimated the figure to be in the region of £2.5 billion, so they seem to be turning a healthy profit for their subjects. There could be tricky times ahead for King Charles III, though. Several Commonwealth countries are now reported to be considering cutting ties with the royal family over concerns that the king's symbolic role serves only as an unpleasant reminder of Britain's colonial past. <laughs> Yeah, it does, though, doesn't it? Meanwhile, support for the royals appears to be on the wane in the UK, particularly among young people. A recent YouGov poll suggested that only a third of 18 to 24 year olds want to see the monarchy continue, while 41% would prefer to see an elected head of state. I'm one of those 41%, let's go. There could be an even bigger Annus Horribilis looming in the distant horizon. I still reckon Buckingham Palace and all other royal residences would prove to be an even bigger tourist attraction if the royal family were evicted and moved to sheltered accommodation, freeing up the private rooms for tourists for the first time. Be a pretty pimp ass hotel, wouldn't it? Buckingham Palace? <laughs> it would get quickly bought up by like the Ritz Carlton Group or something. <laughs> it would be like Buckingham Palace at the Ritz. <laughs> 
Does it even matter if the royal family still live there or not? It's not like a typical tourist gets to enjoy a selfie and a mince pie with the king. Boot them out, build a few crazy golf courses in the garden, and watch that royal revenue soar. Danny and I, same page. Thanks for watching. But in contrast, up until the very recent death of Queen Elizabeth II. What? What? The Queen died? When? No, I'm just kidding. I know the Queen died. Ha! Got him!